My senses are continually bombarded. The eye by forms, the ears by sounds, the nose by aromas, the tongue by flavors, and the body by contact. All of these things I investigate. In that way, each of my sense faculties becomes a teacher. Little Gao. Tapai did not like this busy world, but she tolerated it. Her one abiding solace had always been the monastery, the religious ceremonies, the spiritual practices. In this vacuum, she was further restricted by her husband, who felt that a woman's place was in the home and with her family, not in the outside world, and certainly not in the spiritual world. Very old beliefs divided Dai culture and community life into separate spheres, high and low, male and female. That was part of Tapai's world, too. It was ingrained in her upbringing and not to be violated. Tapai's husband allowed her precious little personal freedom. That was his prerogative, and part of the unspoken marriage bargain. He forbade her to attend observance days at the monastery, and limited her spiritual activities to offering food to the monks in the morning and chanting parittas at night. She acquiesced to his demands. She had no other choice. Tapai's housework and farm chores became the spiritual practices that shaped her married life. Her days were often long and tedious, but she strove to convert the boredom into concentration. She taught herself to concentrate in the midst of the chaos and confusion of life, reigning in her mind and forcing herself to focus right in the middle of feeling anger and resentment. When she felt resentment for her husband, she tried to transform her feeling into love and compassion. When she found herself envious of others, she reflected on the life of a renunciant and on how a John Munn had promised her that one day she would renounce this world to wear the plain white robes of a nun. Tapai understood intuitively the value of deep spiritual practice, but for the moment she had to content herself with sanctifying the common practices of daily existence. Dutifully, she attended to all the chores. Aware all the while that she was not content, Tapai felt the boundaries of her constricted life, the small, tight corners of her marriage that hemmed her in on all sides. What she saw... What she heard, what she felt, was dissatisfaction. She was seventeen, and before long, she was twenty-seven. It seemed as though every year was a repetition of the same tedium, the same suffering. She resigned herself to things as they were, as they always had been, withdrawing to her contemplative practices and trying to make the little things sacred. Tabai began to think more and more about leaving the world behind to don the simple dress and assume the uncomplicated life of a Buddhist nun. Gradually, very quietly, her determination grew, gaining momentum with each passing season, until it seemed as though she had never wanted anything else. Finally, one evening after dinner, she knelt beside her husband and tried to make him understand how she felt, how she wanted to be relieved of her domestic duties so she could renounce the world and ordain. Her husband's response was cold and uncompromising. He flatly refused, rejecting all further discussion. Silently, with eyes dutifully cast down, Tapai accepted his judgment and went on with her life. Tapai's life continued much the same day after day. Patiently, hopefully, she bided her time. Some weeks later, when she saw her husband in a good mood, she tried again, pleading for her freedom and again her husband refused. He said that if he let her become a nun, people would gossip, saying that she left him because he was an unworthy husband, because he'd failed to give her a child. Tapai didn't know what to say. It was true that they had lived together for ten years without children. They were both surrounded by large, extensive families, but their own family never grew. Perhaps it was a fortunate karmic consequence this turn of fate should have made it easier for her to simply walk away. Instead, it was used as a reason to thwart her departure. She tried one more time to reason with him to reach a mutual understanding, but to no avail. His answer was no. Putai families were generally large. Each birth was celebrated as a victory to their survival, with each new child expected to help bear the workload. Children grew up to share the burden of farming and housekeeping, and then to take care of their parents in old age. After so many years of childless marriage, Tapai's aunts and cousins worried about her welfare. Who would look after her when she grew old? So, when one of her cousins, 
a woman with many children, became pregnant yet again, it was decided that the baby should be given to Tapai to bring up as her own. By prior arrangement with the mother, Tapai helped deliver a healthy baby girl, whom she cradled in her arms and lovingly carried home immediately after birth. Tapai quickly named the girl Gao, her little darling. When people noticed Tapai's delight with the baby and how motherly her affections were, always attentive and caring, they began to call her Mei Gao, Gao's mother. Because it sounded so natural, the name stuck, and from then on she was known affectionately as Mei Gao. Little Gao grew up to be a spirited and intelligent girl who enthusiastically learned her mother's daily tasks, skillfully imitating Mei Gao's agile movements and training her young body to assume the rhythm of work until it became second nature. Mei Gao had been forced by the untimely death of her own mother to develop these skills at a tender age, so she expected her daughter to cultivate the same sense of purpose and commitment. Raising a daughter became a playful and joyous experience. It distracted Mei Gao from the confining restrictions of her life and freed her, at least temporarily, from their tedium. She yearned to share her spiritual longings with someone, but Gao was still too young, too innocent, too carefree to notice the suffering in the world around her. For Mei Gao, who had long ago become intimate with the pain and suffering of the world, the affliction borne by those around her affected her like a wound in the chest, sharp and heavy. She felt the harsh, unforgiving life of ordinary village people who struggled daily with work. They worked all their lives, from youth through old age until death. The joy of birth was followed by the sorrow of death, ravaging floods followed by devastating droughts. The same year that she adopted Gao, Mei Gao's father died. Sorrow followed joy. Then the rains failed, and so did their rice crop. Happiness and suffering seeming to appear always as a pair, like two wheels of a cart working in tandem to drive a person's life towards death, and future birth when the wheels started churning anew. Mei Gao saw that change and suffering were central in life, that everything changed, and no one escaped suffering. Through the joys and sorrows, the good seasons and the bad, Mei Gao never relinquished her heart's true aspiration. Being fixed and deeply rooted, below the shifting surface of appearances, renunciation remained the abiding purpose of her existence. She often visualized herself joining the nuns at Wat Nong Nong, shaving her head, wearing plain white garments, living in bare, uncomplicated silence, and meditating again, undisturbed. Renunciation as a way of life. For so many years she had trained herself to live in the world and not get lost in it, to know the turbulence of her mind and make it peaceful. Happiness and suffering, gladness and sorrow, these were the fluctuations that gave her no peace, the moods that deceived the mind and made her forget herself and her purpose. As she assumed more responsibility with age, peace was losing out to frustration, the nagging disappointment of unfulfillment. A John Munn's parting promise, that one day she would experience the realization of that dream, had always been a sanctuary for her restive heart. But now, with a daughter to bring up, the possibility of ordaining seemed more remote than ever. Still, if a life of total renunciation was out of the question, perhaps a short retreat could be managed. After all, young village men often ordain temporarily, becoming monks for the duration of a single rains retreat, before returning, reinvigorated, to lay life. It was considered a rite of passage. Even married men renounced the world for short spells. Why couldn't she do the same? Of course, she had her daughter to consider. But at eight years of age, Gao was already competent enough to do the housework and attend to her father's needs for three months. Mei Gao could count on her cousins to help out too. To be sure, she would see that all the heavy work was completed first, the back-breaking labor of plowing and planting the rice crop, and she would return home from retreat just in time to bring in the harvest. Her husband had always made it clear that he would never release her to tread the spiritual path. But maybe, with careful planning, an arrangement could be worked out, a compromise of sorts. A little freedom seemed better than no freedom at all, a few steps along the path better than no journey at all. So again, Mei Gao knelt beside her husband, as she had first done ten years before, and spoke from the heart about her desire to open one small window of freedom in her life, 
one brief chapter that would be all her own. Her place was the home and the family. She accepted that. But she begged for this short opportunity to realize her lifelong dream. She detailed the arrangements she intended to make, the care she would take to assure that home life ran smoothly in her absence, and she solemnly promised to return as soon as the three-month retreat ended. Expressionless, staring straight ahead, her husband listened silently until she finished speaking. He then turned to face her, already shaking his head, and, with a dismissive gesture, told her to forget about ordaining. She had a husband to look after and a daughter to raise, and that was a full-time job. He didn't want to hear any more about her dreams. So, Mei Gao crawled back into the tight corners of her life and waited. Patience was a virtue. Compassion and forgiveness were also virtues. She resisted resenting her husband and the restrictions he placed on her. She loved her daughter and she respected his wishes, but she did not give up dreaming. Hope for Mei Gao became a saving virtue. So, the following year, with the retreat period approaching, she tried yet again to negotiate a concession from her husband. Though her husband's reply was more conciliatory this time, and less blunt, it was no less dismissive than before, and no less disheartening. Her predicament was known and gossiped about on both sides of the family. Some were in favor, others opposed. An elderly uncle, respected and admired by all for his wisdom and sense of fairness, was asked to mediate. He had known Mei Gao since she was a young girl accompanying her father to visit a John Mun, and he sympathized with her righteous intentions. He decided to honor her recently deceased father by arguing for a favorable outcome. Speaking privately with his niece's husband, he extolled the virtues of religious practice and urged him to be fair and reasonable, gently pressuring him to accept a short-term compromise. In the end, an agreement was reached. Bun Ma would allow his wife to ordain for the three-month rains retreat, but not a day longer. As his part of the bargain, he vowed to uphold the integrity of the family and take care of their daughter in her absence. He was even persuaded to observe three months of abstinence by keeping faith with the five moral precepts until her return. To refrain from killing, stealing, lying, adultery, and intoxicants. It was a common, basic religious practice, but one which he rarely had the inclination to follow. Surprised, bemused, and delighted by the sudden turn of events, Mei Gao raised joined palms to her forehead and let the thankfulness sink in. A John Mun's twenty-year-old prediction was finally coming true. Focusing inward for a moment, she vowed a solemn determination to make the most of her time as a nun. Meditation was foremost in her thoughts, an unfulfilled mission suspended in time, awaiting and now demanding attention. After so many past disappointments, she would not disappoint herself.